We have already covered the index calculus attacks. Now in this uh, short video, I want to give you an example of how the schoolwork version of index calculus attacks works. So again, this is not how you would attack it if you're going for some real world target. It's just a way to see what the main stages or what the main parts are, what the main ideas are. So this is a simplified version of the R. So this is just a copy of what we had already in the second uh, talk on this topic and stating just what the algorithm is doing. So this is the first stage where you we were trying to find relations after having fixed factor bases. And the relation, just as a reminder, is we're picking the generator, which is given to us as part of the challenge. We're picking this g to some random power j. Um, looking at this as a fine field element, so we're reducing mod p, and then we look at it as an integer in this interval 0 to p minus 1. Then we ask, does this factor over a factor base? Now your factor base is larger, it has a higher chance of factoring in there, but also, well, it says you have to repeat this falling until f plus 4 relations are collected, where f is the size of the factor base. So it might get easier, it will get easier if your factor base is larger, but in turn, you need to do more repetitions. And then at the end of the stage, you're putting everything into a matrix and you're solving the system, uh, the system of equations. Now, the system of equations means you're looking at the exponents of the small primes that are the P1 to EF, and then there's the J, which is the J that you put into your factor base. And then we're looking at this matrix as a homogeneous system and solve. So afterwards, we can figure out what the basis, well, what the logarithm of pi with the base g is. So we know that the sum over all these exponents times its logarithms is equal to j. And we're solving it in an algebra system, um, and the answer is going to be ai, which is the discrete log of pi with base g. So as a small example, I'm looking at the prime 107, and then g equals 2 is a generator. A generator means that any element, uh, any non-zero element, module 107, is a power of 2. And so I'm just picking 99 as a nice number to find out what the discrete log is. So I don't actually know what the answer is. Okay, so then I need to define a factor base. So I need to pick something which is not too impossible to find some relations, but I also don't want to use more space than the slide has. So I'm picking a smallish factor base with just the first four primes. So just picking two, three, five, and seven. And then I was told that little lowercase f is a size of this. So there are four primes, so f is four. Now I will deviate a little bit from what the algorithm is saying, which tells me I have to find f plus four relations. This plus four is meant for large examples. Actually, for smaller examples, it's not enough to well, try even just with f. I want to try f plus 1. Okay, but for the rest, I'll follow what's said here. So I'm picking a random integer, and well, what could be more random than 23? So I'm computing g to the 23. That means 2 to the 23, point to 107, and then the result of this is 22. 22, I can factor in my head, that's 2 times 11. And now, well, 11 that I got here as a factor is larger than the largest element in my factor base. So my prime bound is b was. Uh, say 8, and then 11 is definitely larger, so I don't allow this relation to go in. So this is not f smooth, it means it does not factor into the primes that are all included in f factor base, so do not get a relation. I also tried 42, which also didn't give me a relation, but then I tried 12, and 12 gave me that g to the 12 is 30, and 30 factors very nice, there's 2 times 3 times 5, and so that gives me a relation. Now remember what the relation means is I'm looking at the power of, so these bi, that's the first one is the power of 2, this is the power of 3, power of 5, and then power of 7. Well, I don't have a 7 here, so that means 7 comes in as 7 to the 0. And then the j, that is the integer I picked, so the last component of this vector here is this exponent of g here. So this gives me one relation, namely the relation 1, 1, 1 for the power of 2, 3, and 5, 0 for the power of 7, and then 12 as the exponent of g. And then I tried a few more, and I'm only going to report on the successful ones. So for instance, g to the 82 gave me 90, which again was very nicely f smooth. So there I'm having an example where one of the exponents comes in as 
larger powers are say x squared 1, x squared 2, x squared 1, and x squared 0. 7, so I'll write it as 1, 2, 1, 0. And then the 82 is the number that I want. I tried another one, d to the 7, which was 21. And so this finally gives me all simulation, which includes the 7. Okay, so row 2, 1, 3, row 5, 1, 7. And then this 7 here, that is the 7 from the front here. Um, it's a good example in that I finally got a 7. It is a bad example in that it's like education is leading to have a 7 here, but it just so happened. Now, this is not f plus 4, this is not age relations. But there's a like, I'm feeling lucky, or let's be optimistic. Um, I should also point out that g u2, well, I know what the base 2 logarithm is of 2, namely that's just 1. I mean, g to the 1 is my first factor base element, so I do know that I have the logarithm of 1. And then if I look at these relations here, well, if I divide this one, the second one, by the, sorry, the third one by the second one, then I'm getting a relation of just 4 and 3, and then I know the relations of 2 and 3, so I can get the 5, and then from this one, if I know 3, I can get 7. So I'll do this more detail on the last slide, but I have good reasons for being optimistic. So this will be a solvable system. So let me recap. These are the relations that I just get, got. So the power of g here is 1, 12, 30, uh, 82, and 7. Those go in the last component. And then, this time I've been writing out all the exponents, even if they're zero, then only the exponents go in here, because, well, this is a linear system, in the exponents, where we are having as variables the discrete log of 2, discrete log of 3, 5, and 7. In the first position is the discrete log of 2, and it appears at 1 times, discrete log of 3 it appears at 0 times, etc., etc. Okay, so now I have a 4 equation system, 4 unknowns, and then a right hand side. So that means it's an inhomogeneous system. And the output of this is going to be the discrete logs of these things. So I'm now putting all of these into a matrix. So just here you have your left hand side, that's the exponent vectors, the first part, and then the right hand side, those are the powers of G that we put in. Now the first row is already nice. If I'm now doing Gauche elimination, I'm totally done on this one. So that I can just copy over. Now the next step in Gauche elimination, what I will do is I'm taking the second row and subtracting it from the third row. Because it will give me a 0 in this position, a 1 in this position, a 0 in this position, a 0 in this position, and then, well, 82 minus 12, so 70 in the last position. And okay, since I want to achieve the diagonal here once, I'm moving it also up. So now I still have two more equations I need to deal with, second one, third one. So let me deal with the second one now. Okay, I'm having the discrete log of 1, so I can just subtract it here, so that's 12 minus 1, that's 11. Then I know the discrete log of 3, so I can just subtract this one here. Okay, so then I'm having 11 minus 70. Now, at this point, the discrete logs won't be negative. I have to remember what I'm computing, and we're working in a group where well, g is reduced to 107, so that means by the Maslow theorem that the exponents are being reduced to 106. So always want to p minus 1. Or for generality, if you wouldn't have g being a primitive element, one that generates the whole group, you would just reduce one in the order of g. So the seven, uh, 11 minus 17, we're actually computing modulo 106. So what we're seeing here is, well, 106 minus 70 plus 11. And so 106 minus 70 is 36 plus 11 is 47. And that's what I put here. And then finally, well, now I have these three pure equations. And then the last one, I just need to take this row again with a 70 and subtract it from the last one in order to get 0, 0, 0, 1. And so there what I'm seeing is 7 minus 70, again, modulo 106. 
so 36% is 43. So I've also put this as a note here, so the computations are mod p minus 1, and you should actually in hindsight notice that I was kind of lucky, not just that four equations was enough, but also if I'm doing an algebra modulo a composite number, because 106 is not 1, it's 2 times 53, I could have easily gotten into a situation where I would have to divide by 2, and you can't divide by 2 what will a number that is even. So I had a 50-50 chance of actually running into this. Now, for this example, it didn't happen, but what I normally would expect is that, well, somewhere I get stuck. And so the way to wait out of this is that instead of solving model 106, you're solving model the largest factor for which it's invertible, in this case it would be 53. Then you're getting all your AIs mod 53, and okay, since you just want to know something which is mod 106, for each of those you have two possibilities. So you're getting AI, that is the AI bar, sorry, that is the number mod 53, and that might be the right AI, or it's AI bar plus 53. And you cannot distinguish it from with the matrix because you wouldn't have needed to divide by two. Hypothetical situation doesn't appear here, but in general, when you're like putting this into a system solver, like you ask the sage, hey, take this matrix for me and solve it, you might get stuck exactly at this step because it's not a prime. So this might either be, well, this might, you know, the way it's out might either be that your G is actually not a generator of the whole group, but you know that the group order is prime. So if it's an interval example, then your G normally has a prime order, and so this is not a problem. Or you do this, as I described here, Module the largest uh, divisor of p minus 1 for which this matrix is invertible, and then you do a brute force search for the residue class. This is also the right moment to double check your results. So, at this moment, you should say, okay, well, if the discrete log of 3 base, seven, uh, base 2 is 70, let me compute g to the 70 and see whether that's true. Similarly, here, you're taking this g to the, five, uh, g to the 47 and see whether it's 5 and g to the 43 should give you 1. So a nice thing about all these crypto thing systems, about these attacks, is once you are done, you have a very efficient way to verify that your results are correct. So you should, by all means, always do that. Because then you know, well, maybe I made something which is not as beautiful as it could be written out, but at least the math is correct. I'm done. Or you notice, hey, wait a second, this doesn't actually give me 7. The other ones are correct, but I, well, must have done something wrong. And if it's just in the last equation, so if you notice that everything before it is fine, you checked all these threes, they're good, and you made some typo here, let's say root 42, because it's your favorite number, then you're like, maybe I miscalculate there. Maybe you didn't compute mod p minus 1. It's a typical mistake that people do. They compute mod p because there's so much used to compute mod p. But remember, we're in the exponent, not at the base. We're in the exponent. All these relations play purely in the exponent. The relation turns into 1, 0, 0, 0, which is different from 2 and so on. So, one in the exponents, we're computing mod 106, mod 10 p minus 1, and in the bases, we're computing mod p. All right, so now we have successfully managed uh, stage 1, and so then we get into stage 2. This is what I had on the slide for stage 2, and that is where the target comes in. So with the target, we're now trying to find, so this is our target H, which was 99 in my example. We're now picking random integers k, we're looking at g to the k times h, and then we ask whether this is f smooth. So lots of those steps have happened in stage 1. In stage 2, we're only doing a single one of those. If this succeeds, so if we have such a factorization, pi to the pi, we now know all the discrete logs of pi, so then we can just compute the discrete log of h as taking this ei to the ai, which we computed in stage 1, and then this k that we put in here, we have to subtract. And all of this model the order of g, so in our case, model 106. Well, so let's do that. So in our case, uh, let me remind you that the discrete log of 2 was 1, of 3 was 70, of 5 was 47, and of 7 was 43. That's what we got out of this matrix. And so this is my, these are my AIs that I need down here. And then, well, this is copied from the previous slide. 
just some b. So I'm starting with h equals 99, so k is 1. Of course, well, let's check whether it just works. And in this case, 99 is 3 squared times 11, which is not f. Remember, my f went only till 7, so 11 is too large a part. Okay, so then I try a few numbers. So this is not f smooth, so I'll try some more eventually. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you see me typing on my computer, and eventually I smile because I found that g to the 31 times h is 98. Now, 98 is just 2 times 49, or 2 times 7 squared, and that one is f smooth. Okay, so all that remains now is to correctly identify all the pieces here. Um, let me start with the ei ai. So I'm having 2 to the power 1. And then the discrete log of 2 is 1. So this is just 1. And then I'm having 2 times, let's say, 4, 2 times the discrete log of 7, which is 43. So 2 times 43. And then I'm putting the minus k in the last position, so minus 31. That was the 31 coming from here. And I'm doing all of this computation modulo 100. Now, in this case, since the first numbers are large enough, we don't actually notice the reduction modulo 106, but again, everything that's at the exponent has to be taken modulo the order of t. Okay, so we just broke our first discrete log, or did we? So again, this is something where you might make mistakes, it's error prone, so, well, make sure to test. Is actually g to the 56, which we got, is it equal to 99? And in this case, yes it is, so we are happy because we know we have absolutely correctly solved this exercise, so we're getting the guarantee that we're done, that we found the right solution by just verifying. And so also if you would be doing this as a big computation, like you're having all these clients in different continents do some work for you, they submit their solutions, it might be that some of those relations got messed up. And so it might actually be that some of those things are erroneous. And so you're doing well in always checking all intermediate stages, and it's a nice feature of the scripture systems that to verify is very efficient, while actually to break the system, to come up with a solution, takes some time. But, well, at this stage, we're done. So we just need to verify, and we have done so successfully. Yeah.